Our next speaker is Dr. Dean Mikami. He's going to show his video on upper endoscopy and, and uh, comment on that as well. Uh, I should say, Dr. Asman made some comments about the, the uh, Educational Resources Committee, for which I'm the chair. And this is really a labor of love for the co from the committee. So the, the committee actually is the, the group that put the, put the uh, video topics together. And really, a lot of the videos came from members of the committee. But I'll tell you that most that you'll see here that the people who did these committee, uh, these videos are actually experts at what they do. So uh, we're actually very lucky to have them presenting their videos. Uh, Dr. Mikami. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Moriyama and um, Dr. Schneider. So, you no, know, I, I was asked to talk about upper endoscopy. So, if you think about it, you know, why am I talking about upper endoscopy in a surgical meeting? So, uh, every year in, in the United States, we do 250,000 weight loss surgeries. We do about 400,000 hernia operations and about 700,000 lap coles. You know how many upper endoscopies we do in America every year? Five million. <laughs> so. Even though it's, it's great to watch these fantastic videos, but you know, on an average uh, year, we probably, as a surgeon, I do about 600 uh, upper endoscopies. And in our, um, actually, surgery department in Ohio State, we probably do the majority of the uh, upper endoscopies in the hospital. So here are my disclosures. Uh, nothing's going to be uh, uh, discussed that is off-label. So some of the uh, indications for upper endoscopy uh, diagnosing uh, problems. You know, as a surgeon, when I get sent a patient and my GI guy tells me the mass is somewhere in the uh, bottom of the stomach, and you're like, well, I'm going to try to resect it. So, you know, as a surgeon, I really want to know exactly where that mass is. Uh, you can survey your patients years after an operation. You know, they'll um, actually build a rapport with you after you resect your tumor or you fix your reflux. And uh, seeing, them, uh, seeing these patients year after year, it's great to... Um, uh, follows these patients, and uh, of course, uh, therapies that we can offer with upper endoscopy. So some of the uh, diagnostic uh, modalities that we can use it for, uh, persistent upper ab abdominal symptoms. We all have patients with chronic upper abdominal pain. You send them to your GI doctor, they scope them, and they say, well, everything kind of looks normal, but what does that really mean? Um, refractory uh, reflux, you can confirm uh, suspected lesions such as ulcers, cancers, strictures, or even um, soft gas. Other um, diagnostic uh, modalities can be used uh, to identify GI bleeding, uh, caustic injections, sampling or uh, getting samples of tissue, and to rule out malignancy. In the uh, surveillance mode, um, I think it's really important uh, to rule out your high-risk uh, patients that could have cancers, your uh, patients with long-term reflux. You really want to you know, scope them every one to three years. Uh, you, we can use this to follow up after medical or endoscopic uh, treatments on your uh, gastric bypass patients who come in with marginal ulcers. You place them on a regimen for six weeks or three months, and if the symptoms don't get better, you can always rescope your patients and uh, see what's going on. Also, it's very important if you if you run uh, if you do a lot of weight loss surgery, um, look at your your patients post surgery, uh, patients with strictures, uh, patients with uh, um, abdominal pain, you can rule out <coughs> erosions. And some of the uh, therapeutic uh, modalities that we can use it for, um, in my hospital, for some reason, I always get the person who swallows the eight inch knife or the ceiling tile that I get caught in or the, the sporks and the spoons. And we endoscopically can remove most of them. Uh, just uh, last week I removed an eight inch knife from a, a patient, uh, which is really fun, especially when you try to put out the mouth. Um, other things that you can remove, um, uh, such as polyps, uh, you can dilate strictures either with, uh, with a balloon, under floral, uh, using, a, using a guide wire. You can treat bleeding ulcers, uh, look at tumors, and also treat uh, other vascular lesions. Other therapeutic modalities include um, uh, banding or injecting uh, varicose veins. Uh, of course, the uh, PEG-2 placement that we're always asked to do. And unfortunately for, for us as surgeons, usually it's a failed PEG tube by our uh, gastroenterologist. And you see the patient, the patient weighs 600 pounds, and, and uh, somehow we usually get the PEG tubes in. Also, uh, with the uh, new 
techniques that we're seeing, especially at this meeting with uh, POEM, uh, management of achalasia and endos endoscopic uh, hellermyotomies uh, that we're seeing in the near future here. Other endoluminal uh, treatments for reflux that have been on, on the market and uh, have been uh, tested throughout the years, such as ablation, shred, or esophagus. So I think some of the initial things that are important when you see these patients, and you're going to see these patients um, in an average day of probably 15 to 20 patients, you still need to do a thorough history and physical. Make sure you get the signed consent before you give them um, versed and fentanyl. Uh, you want to adjust their medications prior to surgery or prior to their endoscopy. You know, look at their aspirin history, Plavix, uh, Coumadin. Probably try to stop them at least three to ten days prior to your endoscopy. Prophylactic antibiotics for uh, valve patients and lab tests as needed for these patients. So I think the most important thing is sedation. You know, when you at, at Ohio State we sedate our own patients, but uh, it, it takes a lot to understand how much to give uh, to each patient. And I think the key thing is just give enough to have your um, desired effect. So we use fentanyl and Versed. Um, one of the big problems that we see is we scope a lot of our morbid obese patients prior to surgery. They all have sleep apnea. So you want to uh, instruct your patients that we will try to make you comfortable, but we want you to breathe throughout the procedure. You know, if, if the patient's too high risk, I think general anesthesia uh, is warranted. And if absolutely necessary, you can do an endoscopy without sedation. So some of the basic things we're going to uh, talk about today, the basic endoscopic setup, endoscopic controls, room setup, patient positioning, and a quick upper end endoscopy video. So basically, the scopes come in multiple sizes and shapes. Uh, make sure you understand what equipment you have. So if you're removing a foreign body, cutting sutures out, removing staples, you have the right scope uh, for that um, job there. Um, I also want to thank my fellow from a couple years ago, uh, Joe Anderson, who helped make a lot of these uh, surgical videos here. So, so basically, uh, controls of the light, um, you can move the buttons left and right, and when our, our young residents start, they're like, you know, there's 15 different controls. How am I supposed to uh, use all these things at the same time? But it takes practice. We do have simulators that we send the residents out to to learn how to do these endoscopies. So basically, you know, uh, Using your thumb and your uh, index finger, you can control most of the, uh, the knobs on this device here. And I think another very important factor is you got to know how to set up your equipment. So many times we get caught in the middle of the night, the residents are grabbing the cart, and we're like, I don't know how to set up the cart. And I tell the residents, it's very important how to, how to learn how to set up these carts because you'll be caught in the middle of the night to do a flex sig or an upper endoscopy or something. Um, and the tech's not going to be there with you. So um, we have Olympus products in our hospital, so I, I apologize. I only, I only have an Olympus video set up here. But basically, you know, plugging the uh, scope in, plugging your air and water uh, tubes in the, in the right place, and actually uh, knowing where all the buttons are is a very important part of the uh, endoscopy setup here. Um, another thing, I think uh, if you're in the GI suite, having the room set up in the correct fashion, uh, the endoscopist stands to the left of the patient. The tower should be behind the uh, endoscopist. The monitoring position, um, the monitor right in front of uh, the person doing the endoscopy. The nursing station at the head of the bed so we can administer drugs, you know, watch the airway. And we also need a computer these days to document our endoscopy. Room positioning also, you know, we're going to place the patient in the left lateral um, cubitus position. Remove all dentures and oral piercings, very important if you're going to use uh, lecture surgery during the procedure. Head of the bed elevated 30 to 60 degrees. Have a bite block in place. Access for IV uh, medications and administration. And basically, here's a simple upper endoscopy video. Uh, nothing fancy here. So we have the patient in the left uh, lateral um, decubitus position. We're placing the scope down. And uh, I think this is the hardest part for a lot of uh, young people who start doing endoscopy is, you know, they like to move that scope in, in and out, in and out, right into oral pharynx. And then I, I tell them, you know, what's the easiest way to make a patient throw up? Move that scope in and out, in and out, in and out until the patient throws up. So once you find your uh, landmarks, you know, direct the scope straight down, uh, keep the scope in the center, and uh, on this endoscopy we'll demonstrate some uh, biopsies here. So as the scope moves down, 
we're going to try to keep the scope uh, in a straight position here, uh, intubate the uh, pylorus going through the duodenum. And I would, I would say probably a good 30 to 50 upper endoscopies, you'll be uh, pretty uh, proficient uh, in, in doing these procedures. And also very important, document when you're in the um, duodenum. Uh, a lot of times you may forget to dictate or uh, that you were there, but if you have a picture, uh, it proves that you were there. So once we're there, we always kind of set the scope in the middle, take a picture, and then we'll retroflex back on ourselves here um, to see if there's a hiatal hernia. Uh, when we take biopsies, we like to um, not reach that biopsy forcep too far out, but keep the biopsy forcep close to the end of your scope. When you take a biopsy, you know, be firm, grab tissue, and snap that, uh, um, force it back into the scope. All right. So as far as complications, uh, morbidity, one in a thousand, mortality, one in 10,000. Most of these uh, complications are cardiopulmonary in nature, so be wary of the amount of sedation that you give. Um, complications that can also occur, perforation, bleeding, and uh, during hemostatic uh, interventions, you can cause a perforation or cause uh, further bleeding. Uh, also very important to monitor the patients uh, until the patient's awake for at least an hour. X-ray your patients if they have persistent abdominal pain uh, and other scans can be done there. So in conclusion, I think flexible endoscopy has uh, dramatically changed the treatment of um, GI diseases. Once again, we perform five million upper endoscopies a year and I think uh, inter uh, endoscopic intervention skills are a necessary part of uh, a surgeon's repertoire. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.